Hello, friends. Grace and peace to you all. Welcome back to our Monday night Bible study. So happy to have you here, all of us together. Let me give me one second. I'm fixing my shade. It drives me crazy when the shade is not uh, going down correctly. It's like my my OCD. <laughs> but great to be with you guys. Uh, God bless you all. Let me see here. I just want to make sure everything is uh, kosher, with, electronically speaking. Okay. Looks good. Looks good. All right. Hello, everyone. Yes. Beautiful. All right, guys. So the gift of the spirit, part two, um, second part of a, maybe a few more parts. Really, we're going to only meet for um, on this series, for this particular series, probably another one or two, maybe three more classes on this particular three month study on the Holy Spirit and the mini series we're currently going through right now. The gift of the spirit. Um, what do I want to say? A couple of things. Some important reminders that I sent by way of email today. Next week, no class. We will not be having class next week, Monday. I just sent that out by way of email several hours back. Uh, I will hopefully remember to send out another email as a reminder. But if I don't, please remember, no class next week, Monday. Okay? Okay. Um, in addition, I sent also two links today to all of you, and I hope and pray that you guys got it. Uh, one link for a spiritual gifts inventory questionnaire that you can do online. Uh, I would encourage all of you to do that. Okay. Uh, just go on there, check it out, hit the, hit the hyperlink. It'll take you to the spiritual gifts inventory page maybe some of you have done this before and if you have it's good to do it again if you've done it many years ago right uh check it out discern go through that process pretty cool it takes about 15 20 minutes max to go through all the questions uh but it calculates for you in the end it tells you the kind of gift mix that you have pretty nifty <clears throat> sweet so so check that out enjoy that, the spiritual gift inventory that I sent by way of email. In addition to that, I sent another uh, <clears throat> link that gives a description for the gifts. I'm actually going to pull that up for those of you who are zooming in. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am pulling up uh, uh, this link that I sent to all of you. Gifts and charisms. Okay, it's put out by the Diocese of Lafayette. Okay, so you have it right there. And if you scroll down, again, I'm, I'm doing this by way of the sc uh, screen share, so you should be able to see that. Uh, it's a nice breakdown of what the gifts and the charisms of the Holy Spirit are. So you have here some passages out of the Catechism of the Catholic Church some of which we've probably gone through already. Then it goes into the biblical gifts of the Spirit when you are being confirmed, when you're receiving the sacrament of confirmation. This is one of the things you, you learn about, right? The sevenfold gift of the Spirit, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, uh, piety, fear of the Lord, knowledge, okay? And then you have uh, what here is listed as the motivational gifts, uh, coming out of the uh, book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. A uh, little description there. And you have prophecy, ministry, teacher, exhorter, contributor, administrator, one who shows mercy. Uh, Peter 4, 1 Peter 4, 8 to 11 also goes a bit into that. And then finally, the gifts that we looked at last week, just out of uh, 1 Corinthians, chapter 12. These are sometimes called... The manifestation gifts, okay, or sometimes the charismatic gifts of the spirit. They are not natural abilities, but purely supernatural in origin. And they are the gift of knowledge, or sometimes here understood as the expression of knowledge, the expression of wisdom, discernment of spirits. Again, this list is coming out of scripture. But what's great about this, guys, is that it goes into a whole teaching as to what each of these gifts are, okay? Uh, tongues, the interpretation of tongues. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Prophecy, 
faith, gifts of healing, uh, miraculous powers, and so on. Okay, so so you know, I just I'm obviously going through this very quickly. Um, my hope and prayer is that all of you have access to this website. Very nice breakdown of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So let me bring us back to, oops, let me bring us back to our PowerPoint slide, if I can figure out how to do that. There we go. Uh, boom. <clears throat> okay, so gifts of the Holy Spirit, or the gift of the Spirit, which is the actual title. But we're still going through the gifts, plural. So I uh, hope you guys are enjoying this beautiful weather. Oh, my gosh. For those of you who are zooming in from a different part of the country or the world, you are welcome, right? Uh, grace and peace to you all. But here in New York City, 76 degrees, 78, probably even reached 80. I don't know, but it was gorgeous today. Still beautiful outside. And so we're going to do a deep dive into this continued study. Now, we have an opening prayer uh, this this evening that we're going to tend to. I'm going to turn to that right now for us. Here we go. And this will get us started as we center ourselves upon the love of God. And so we begin as always in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we gather today, this evening, with hearts open to your divine presence seeking to understand the profound gifts you bestow upon us through your Holy Spirit. As we embark on this journey to explore the charismatic gifts, we ask for your wisdom and guidance, O Lord. Enlighten our minds and kindle our hearts with the fire of your Spirit. Help us to discern and appreciate the ways these gifts can be actively present in our lives and used for the greater glory of your kingdom. Pour out your spirit upon us that we may grow in the fruit of your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May this study tonight, this evening, deepen our faith and inspire us to live more fully in your service. We pray that our time together strengthens our fellowship and enhances our understanding of the spiritual gifts granted to each of us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Right. So as it is our custom, we begin here with the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This evening, we're looking at paragraphs 733 up until 736. Looking at 733, it reads, God is love. And love is his first gift containing all others. All right, let's stop right there. For those of you who are zooming in, you can see that I have highlighted that opening sentence. I've also emboldened uh, the last few words in that sentence. Really important, very impactful. If we just take a step back and absorb these words, not just simply into our minds, but in our very hearts. It starts with that awesome reminder, which comes from the Apostle John in 1 John, when he says, God is love. And it goes on to say, love is his first gift containing all others. So this is fascinating, right? Because sometimes we can get caught up on the supernatural in the sense of the display of power or something fantastical over the top. Is there room, is there space, is there a need for that kind of display of power in the kingdom of God and in the church? The answer is yes. That's why God the Spirit gives us those gifts to work miracles, to bring about healing, 
the gift of prophecy, all of those things that St. Paul and the apostles write about. So yes, they are needed for us to do what we are called to do in the kingdom of God. But that is not the end of the gifts. That's not um, the focus of the gifts, but rather the very base root and height of all of these gifts is contained in this one word, love. And this is an important message that St. Paul brings home to that church in Corinth, as we will read, especially next time we meet in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But what we see here in the catechism is, is that love contains all of the gifts. It goes on to say God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. St. Augustine says the Holy Spirit is the love of God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit, the divine paraclete, is the very personification of love, eternally displayed in the economy of grace. And that is given to us, and we are grafted into this economy of love. And so all of this is all about love. But again, the question is, what is love? How are we to understand this? Because the kind of notion of love that we have from our merely earthly experience is either really too broken or a pale comparison, a very, very poor copy of what God's love actually is. The Apostle John says, we know of love because God first showed us love. I'm paraphrasing him. That we come to know actually what true love is by recognizing who Christ is and what he has done in the Paschal mystery. That he saw us in our great need. He came down to us. He laid his life down for us so that we might be saved. Okay? And all of this is a display of the Spirit's power and presence. And right there, all the gifts are contained. In paragraph 734, it reads, because we are dead or at least wounded through sin, the first effect of the gift of love is the forgiveness of our sins. How beautiful is that, right? That love's encounter with us is first displayed in mercy. In mercy. Why mercy? Because our sins really call out for justice and a proper judgment. But God, as it were, turns his cheek. God absorbs the blow of sin. He jumps in front of the speeding car to save us, pushing us out of the way. He takes the bullet for you and I using poor metaphors, right? But he essentially sacrifices himself in his son so that our sins are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is love expressed as mercy. And thus our sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. It goes on to say the communion of the Holy Spirit in the church restores to the baptized the divine likeness lost through sin. Each and every one of us are made in the image and likeness of God. But so much of that is marred and scarred through our sin. Lost because of Adam and Eve and our own actions, we still bore the image of God, but the likeness of God was far gone. And yet it is restored through Christ. Hallelujah. In paragraph 735, it goes on to say, he then gives us the pledge or first fruits of our inheritance. The very life of the Holy Trinity, which is to 
love as God has loved us. I love that word pledge as well as first fruits. I, a couple of classes back, I gave the metaphor of cooking. Let's say if I were in the kitchen and you uh, were in another room and you smelled all oh, that food that Joe is putting together, right? The scent, as it were, is a pledge, right? That aroma comes to you as, oh, this is going to be good, right? You get a kind of down payment, if you will, mixing metaphors here, but you get the idea, right? Or if I say, hey, if I come with like a little wooden spoon, I say, hey, taste this. Tell me what you think. And you, oh my goodness, Joe, that is, that's amazing. I can't wait to eat. This is what the Lord does in giving to you and I the Holy Spirit. It is a down payment. It is a pledge. It is the first fruit of the harvest, right? The full harvest hasn't yet come. The kingdom of God has not yet fully arrived. And yet, mysteriously, it is here already. Right? So we are, right, we're waiting for the fullness, but yet we get the taste. We see the displays of power of the Spirit. We, we receive and, and participate in the sacramental life, the mysteries of the church, right? All of this is the, is the manifest presence of God the Spirit in our lives. And it's designed to not only improve Power us for the here and now of our daily existence, but to draw us, to woo us into the hereafter, what is to fully and finally come. In paragraph 736, it reads, by this power of the spirit, God's children can bear much fruit. He who has grafted us onto the true vine will make us bear the fruit of the Spirit. Again, there it is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, this is what is given to you and I. The question, of course, is, are we experiencing this in our life? Right, Because there are a couple of things that can get in the way of us experiencing the fruit of the Spirit. If I am living out in habitual sin, if I have upon my soul the stain of mortal sin, if I am far from the holy sacrifice of the Mass and barely avail myself of the sacraments, right? If I'm living according to the dictates of the flesh, rather than walking in concert and in step with the spirit. If I end up loving the things of this world, right? The lusts of the eyes, the lusts of the flesh, as St. John speaks of, and the, and the pride of life more than God. Oh, all of these are ways in which we can hinder, if you will, the very bearing of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. But if we run to the merciful heart of Jesus, if we even every morning we come to God like this, with our hands open saying, Lord, thank you for this new day. I ask you, Holy Spirit, cleanse me, renew me, fill my heart with your love, Lord. Lord, use me today as an instrument, as a vessel in your kingdom. Lord, I give you my mouth so that you may speak your words through me to others. Let me to speak uh, life rather than death, blessings rather than curses. Lord, I give you my, my hands that my hands may be busy, not as a busy body doing things only that I want to do, but ways in which I can serve the common good of humanity, ways in which I can find uh, 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 needs and come and fulfill those needs. Lord, take my legs, fill me with your spirit, empower my legs to carry me to places where you want me to go, rather than what my fallen flesh desires. Crucify my old nature, Lord, 
I give you, I give you my very life and my breath for this new day. Now that's a spirit empowered prayer, right? When we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, I'm an empty vessel. Fill me with your life. Strengthen me. I need your grace, Lord, right? When we come with a childlike faith, even every day, and not just at the beginning of the day, in moments throughout the day, we pause and we turn inward to where the spirit is and turning inward, we also turn upward and outward, knowing that God who is transcendent is also the God who is closer to me than I am to myself the God who surrounds me, and I pause throughout the day to say, thank you, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Refill me, Lord, with that joy, that new wine of your gift. And guess what? When we do that, friends, God is faithful. When we put the spiritual disciplines into practice, when we are engaged in prayer, in fasting, in almsgiving, when we're walking the walk, guess what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These begin to bubble over in our lives. And so in paragraph 736 ends by saying this, we live by the Spirit. The more we renounce ourselves, you see that? The more we renounce ourselves, Jesus says, deny yourself daily. Pick up your cross and follow me. The more we walk by the Spirit. Right? It's very easy, very natural for us to put ourselves first in a certain way. Uh, uh, and, and, and to live selfishly. But as Christians, we are called to something so much more. Not an egocentric way of being, but a theocentric way of existing. Right? God is the center. It is God's story. And in that, I am invited by his love to be a character in his story. Right? The book of Acts doesn't end in the final chapter in the Bible. The book of Acts continues in the church today in 2024 with you and I. The question is, how are we answering that call? How are we saying yes to the Lord? So to keep it very practical and very earthy, how can we grow in the fruit of the Spirit? Simply by imitating Jesus, by resting in Jesus, by abiding in the true vine, as Jesus himself teaches in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, by saying yes to Jesus in our daily life, in what we say, in what we do, in what we don't say, what we don't do living out a life in imitation of our Lord, we are creating more room, more space in our heart for the Holy Spirit to fill us. So if I come with a thumbnail size cup, can the Holy Spirit fill that thumbnail? Sure, it's going to fill up the thumbnail, but I'm going to have this much amount of the Holy Spirit. But if I open that up, if I say, oh, no, 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 Dad, thank you for this thumbnail, but now I'm ready for more, Lord, right? Okay, you're ready for more. Beautiful. Let's continue to grow in our self-denial, in imitation of Christ. Let's practice forgiveness. Let's turn the cheek. Let's pray for, woo, now it's okay, we're expanding, right? Growing pains, yes. But yes, growing pains, and guess what happens? Now more of the spirit, more of the water of life can fill us. And the goal is to not be half filled, but to be overflowing so that the Holy Spirit is pouring out of our lives. So that when our friends, our family, our associates, our neighbors are around us, they say to themselves, Man, there is something different about this person. They have a peace about them. 
They have a joy about them. There, there's something deeper happening in his or her life. This is this is attractive. We're bearing witness. We're bearing witness. We're creating more space. Now, this evening, we're just looking at 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12, up until verse 31. Okay? So a lot of scriptures here. There's a lot on the screen. Um, we went up to verse 11 last week. But what we're going to do is walk through this. Now, just as a quick reminder, what did we look at last week? What was St. Paul doing at the beginning of our reading of 1 Corinthians 12? Well, he reminded us, and this is just a, a very brief reminder, right? He, he taught that although there are a diversity of gifts, there is but one Spirit, one Lord, one God. And that it is God, the Holy Spirit, who providentially gifts the body of Christ with different gifts, different ministries, different apostolates or different services, different capacities. One Lord, despite the diversity of his empowering. And that's what St. Paul was sharing with us last week. And he's going to continue in this in light of the unity of the church, that although there is real diversity of ministries and of gifts and of charisms, it's all one body of Christ. And now we can ask ourselves, why does St. Paul spend time talking about this? Remember some of the problems that this church was dealing with, as I mentioned in our previous studies. One of the great issues with the church in Corinth was that it was very much divided. A lot of factions and cliques were happening. And people were vying for popularity and who's who and who's in the head and, and all kinds of really wild and terrible things that were happening in that church. And so St. Paul is trying to correct them, correct their understanding so that they can live truly in accordance with the Spirit. However, St. Paul does acknowledge that they are a gifted church. You read that at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, that although there's a lot of problems and struggles with the church, they are gifted in the gifts of the Spirit. They are a dynamic group. They're just like a wild, uh, uh, untamed horse, however, right? And, and so St. Paul is seeking to bring order out of the chaos that is so much present in this local parish. And so what he's doing here in verses 12 to 31 is he's going to highlight, I'm just giving you a general overview, he's going to highlight, again, he's going to stay on this theme of the diversity of the gifts, but the unity of the body and what he's going to teach here, what he's going to tell the church in Corinth and by extension you and I is this important truth that one person's gift is not in any way more important than the other person's gift. Or just because some people have these, mm -hmm. others have those kinds of gifts, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that some are better than others, okay? So, so what he's doing here, he's in this business of correcting this inherent, uh, this, this insidious divisiveness that's very much present in the church of Corinth, this place, this port city where they were really walling out, okay? As I mentioned last week, they were doing all kinds of wild stuff. You know that church is very unhealthy when they are getting drunk on the Eucharist. You know the church is not doing well when they're taking each other to court. You know the church is not doing well when some members of the church were frequenting prostitutes. 
Okay, then you read 1 Corinthians, friends. You want to read about scandal? Read 1 Corinthians. And, and it's it's horrible, but you know what the, the, the bright side of this is? This is instructive for you and I because sometimes, and understandably so, right? We get discouraged with the current state of the church in the world or the current state of the church in Brooklyn and Queens or the current state of the church in the United States, wherever. We can get downcast. We can be like, man, this is messed up. Well, what are the bishops doing? What's the church doing? Why is all this nonsense happening? Where are the people of God? Right? This scandal and this thing and this, it's like people are right. And, and it's understandable. It's It could be very discouraging. Yes. But you know what's amazing? There's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> it's nothing new under the sun. Like all we got to do is open up the Bible, read 1 Corinthians as an example. You just read this letter. You're going to be like, what? Uh, what? This is crazy. They were doing what? Yes. Lots of scandal, lots of sin, lots of brokenness. And what's so amazing is the mercy of God. St. Paul, the apostle, doesn't write them off. He doesn't say, all right, guys, we're closing up shop here. I want you guys that I'm, I'm using my apostolic authority. I'm closing that church. You guys, are, you guys passed. No, he doesn't do that. He affirms that they are a dynamic church. He affirms where there was room for affirmation, and he corrects where there really is a need of correction. There's a lot of correction happening in 1 Corinthians, but what St. Paul and what the Holy Spirit never does through St. Paul is, all right, guys, close up shop. You guys failed Christianity. <laughs> right? He's like, no, no, this letter is a sign of grace. This is mercy. God's not done with you yet. And that's encouraging for you and I, friends, if we're keeping it real. And that's really encouraging for the state of the church in the world. Okay? So it becomes then the problems and the scandals found in the church in Corinth become an opportunity for deeper teaching to come forth from the Spirit. Right? A greater awareness is, is afforded through the mishaps of this community. So let's continue in this reading. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning here at verse 12, it reads, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Okay, so for those of you who are zooming in, you could see that I have highlighted that first opening sentence in verse 12. And it really is an opening sentence. This sentence, in a certain sense, gives us the thesis statement. I'm sorry, I'm getting academic on y'all. He's, he's giving us the, the thesis statement, right? The main idea that he's going to drive home in the subsequent uh, sentences and paragraphs. This is the main idea. And, and what is the main idea? One body. Diverse members, one body. The body of Christ is one. And so he's using this rich metaphor for our placement as church in the somatic reality, soma in Greek means body, in the somatic reality of Christ, held together by the divine Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord, that he spent time talking about earlier on in the same book. So again, he says, just as the body has is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. What's so deep about this beautiful image here, and I, and I say this as a philosopher, okay, uh, is this amazing resolution, ecclesiologically speaking, of what is called the problem of the one in many. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but I'll say this, that in the history of, of philosophical ideas, one of those perennial questions that have plagued the world over, both East and West, is the question of what is the relationship between the one and the many? How are we to understand singularity and plurality? And St. Paul says, ah, the church is the answer. 
and the church is the answer precisely because God is the answer as Holy Trinity. Three distinct hypo hypostases or persons, hypostases, yet one God. And so the church, plural, yet one church. And so he's going to run with this, this image of the body and members. Verse 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Mm. How did we get into the one body? Through the sacrament of baptism. In one spirit, for in one spirit, how many Holy Spirits are there? One Holy Spirit. We were all baptized into one body. All into the singular. And then he goes on to give us some ethnic and gender divides, which would have been scandalous at this time. He's saying Jews or Greeks, you're one. Slaves or free. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Jews or Greeks? The Gentiles, the Goyim with the God's chosen people? St. Paul says, yep, that's what Jesus does. One body, Jew or Gentile, one body, slave or free? Socioeconomic status doesn't matter? Nope, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you have 400,000 a year you make or if you have, you don't even have a few pennies to rub together. You, one body, regardless of your socioeconomic uh, class, right? He says, all were made to drink of one spirit. This was revolutionary at the time in which this letter is written. Christianity was super revolutionary. It still really is when you understand what's being said here, right? He says, you, all of us through baptism are in one body, through one spirit. And I love how he goes on to give this, this, this metaphor. He develops, he says, the drink of one spirit. Ooh, that's good. Verse 14. Come on, St. Paul, start preaching now. What does St. Paul say? Verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Oh, look at this now. The body. So think of your body. How many members do you have in your body? So as you hear the word members, it could also be translated as parts. Many parts to your body. Amen? Yes, many parts to your body. Does that mean you have multiple bodies? Nope. You have one body. Many parts, one body. Okay. Okay, I think I know where St. Paul is going. Okay, okay, Paul, go ahead. Verse 15. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. Oh, St. Paul is getting wild now. He is going to drive this metaphor home. He's going to say, look, guys, I'm going to have to spell this out for you. <laughs> I'm going to have to break this down, right? Because some people, you know, some people are duro, right? They're hard. They're like, hey, break it down, break it down, right? What do you, what do you, St. Paul, what are you saying? He said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down for you, okay? He says, imagine the foot saying, imagine your, your left foot saying, I'm not a hand. I'm out. <laughs> it's like, what? No. It doesn't make you any less part of the body. You need your foot. Right? Verse 16. And if the ear, come on now, should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Notice what St. Paul is doing here, right? He's giving us this rich metaphor. He's saying, listen, yes, plurality, yes, diversity, yes, one body. And what is he targeting? The church that's factious, right? It's breaking apart. It's divisive. People are like, oh, I'm, I'm going to roll with this person. No, I don't like this, right? Be careful, one body. And then I love what verse 17 says. If the whole body were an eye, <laughs> if the whole body was an eyeball, where would be the sense of hearing? Mm. This is the great gifts that come out of the Second Vatican Council, which was the recognition of the role of the laity, right? A great, great emphasis on the lay faithful, which, com which is comprised of the vast majority of the body of Christ, not those who are just in sacramental orders. Thank God for bishops. Thank God for, for priests. Thank God for deacons. 
Thank God for the religious as well. But hey, the majority of the church is not comprised of bishops, deacons, and, and religious and priests. It's just not. A very, very small percentage if we talk about the percent of what people are made of in the body. The majority of us are the lay faithful. And the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, says, no, 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 this is this needs to be elevated, right? That, that God is calling all of us to holiness. And he's calling all of us to mission. And he's calling all of us to deny ourselves daily. This is not like, oh, well, that's just a job for the pastor or for the priest or for the missionary somewhere in the other side of the world. No, no. Every single one of us have been baptized prophet, priest, and king. Read the catechism. Teach it. Share this wonderful awareness. And so St. Paul says, look, check it out. Everybody's important. He says, because I am not an I, I do not belong to the body. He said, that would not make it any less part of the body, right? If the whole body were an I, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? Mm, verse 18. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. How gorgeous. How magnificent is God's wisdom and providence that he gives us the different parts of our body, right? The intricate details, the form, the functionality, the anatomy, the physiology, all working as one cohesive unit so that we're able to move, have our being, engage the world. We take it for granted. We're not even aware. And St. Paul, he's saying, no, nah, all of this speaks of diversity within an indefectible unity, a decisive unity. Where does this come from? God, St. Paul says. Verse 19, if all were a single member, if your whole body was just one eyeball, if your whole body was just a nose or an ear, right? In other words, where would the body be? St. Paul says, where is it, right? Verse 20, as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. Can you imagine, can you imagine your body rebelling against itself in this way? Imagine your right hand saying to, to the face, I don't need you. Right. And this is going to try to depart. I mean, being silly here, but but this is the this is the idea that St. Paul is really communicating. He's saying this is why it's stupid to have infighting in the church. This is nonsensical. You are all one, one baptism, one spirit, one Lord. What's this infighting? Who's who? Who cares? We're all in need of each other. That's the point. Verse 22, now listen to what he says. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Mm, come on now. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with great modesty. Look at how far this metaphor in this analogy goes okay think of your pinky think of your little your little toe think of the little small organ in your body that that's invisible to you right that nobody sees but that you need for your survival the smallest parts all are needed for the full flourishing of the entire body right and i love how he says even the the parts uh, that are unpresentable, right, are treated with great modesty, which are our mo which our more presentable parts do not require, right? It's, it's true, right? And then he, notice what he says, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, 
but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, I love this. This is a driving home point. Verse 26, 1 Corinthians 12. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice. That is what love looks like in action. No envy, no hating, no gossiping. No. Even when you're when the smallest part of your body, you have a hangnail. Let's <laughs> say so you have a hangnail, right? And, and it's hurting, it's hurting. Guess what? You feel the whole body's hurting. It's, it's like all of your attention is on this hangnail. Isn't that true? And like your whole body is comported to, to resolving this issue. You have like a, a toothache, a tooth in the back is like, oh, your whole life stops. You're like, no, 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 I gotta, I'm going to the dentist. This, nah, nah, I'm not dealing with this. Yeah, we're getting it done. Okay, whatever it is, <laughs> the whole, your whole being is caught up in it. This is what it's supposed to look like in the church. You're going through suffering. Everybody should be around you. Be like, oh, tell me everything all right. I'm praying for you. I'm here for you. Reach out to me anytime. What? This person gets honored. This person gets elevated. Let's come together. Let's do a little party. Let's rejoice. They're being blessed. We're all blessed. We're all one body in Christ. Oh my gosh, that is amazing. That's what love looks like. See the power of that metaphor? I want to read that again. Verse 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Verse 27. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Verse 28. And God has appointed in the church. Now, here are the offices and here are those, those gifts again and those roles. First apostles and prophets, third teachers and miracles, then the gifts of healing, helping, administration, or administrating in various kinds of tongues. Verse 29, look at what St. Paul now says. He himself is an apostle. Look at what he says. Are all apostles? Right? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Well, clearly in these rhetorical questions that St. Paul is sharing, the answer is no. Not everybody's an apostle. Not everybody's a teacher. Not everybody has the gift to work miracles and so on. So implicit in these questions right, is a recognition of diversity. That's what St. Paul is driving home. He's like, look, everybody's got their gifts. We're all together in the body of Christ. That's okay. God is the one who distributes the gifts to whom he desires. Our focus is to be on God. And now watch what he says, verse 31. But earnestly, this is the closing line for us tonight. But earnestly desire the higher gifts. Hmm. That, that, uh, Joseph Terry didn't say that. That's St. Paul. That's scripture. He says, earnestly desire the higher gifts. Sometimes we have a false humility in the spirit. Sometimes we say, oh, well, you know, I, I, I don't have the gift of healing or I don't got the gift of teaching. Like, oh, well, like I'll just be in the little corner. Right? Be careful. Be careful. St. Paul says, desire the gifts. He says, desire the highest gifts, pray for the gifts of the spirit, right? Mm. Why? Because it comes from God, right? It's not about so-and-so has to shine because they have this very public gift. It's not about that. Remember, whatever gifts that we have, it's for, as we read last week, for the edification of the body of Christ. It is for the minute I start taking my little gift and I start using that as a means for popularity and self-glorification, I'm playing myself. I'm no longer now operating in the spirit that is holy. I'm operating in an unrighteous spirit, very demonic. The first sin is pride. That's how, the, that's how Satan and the angels fell. So be careful. God gives us 
for the sake of the body, for the unity of the body. That being said, when we're motivated by love with the recognition that it is for my brother and sister in the Lord, and by extension, for the propagation of the kingdom of God in this fallen and broken world, once I understand that these gifts are given to me for the sake of the other, then in that awareness, I pray more fervently for the higher gifts. Why? Why? Well, if I'm operating in love, because I can have a greater impact. I can do greater good in the church and in the world. That's why St. Paul says, earnestly desire the higher gifts. It's going to benefit the church and the world. Seek them out. Pray. Speak to the Holy Spirit. Empower me, Holy Spirit, that I may do good in this world. It's not about me, Lord. In fact, Lord, hide me behind the cross. May all glory and honor go to you, Lord, but use me mightily as a fingernail in your body. Use me mightily in whatever capacity, Lord, you want me to so I can bring all glory and honor to you. I can point others to you. Whatever power you give me, Lord, it is for love of you. This is why we look at the saints, because they image this so beautifully. Whether it's St. Therese of Lisieux, whether it's uh, the Cappadocian fathers, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, whether it's the apostles Peter, James, John, St. Paul, whether it's Padre Pio, St. Charbel, whoever it may be, they all point back to Jesus. It's always about Jesus, including the greatest saint who have ever lived, the mother of God, the Blessed Virgin Mary. The last words recorded in the Holy Scripture from her lips in the second luminous mystery at the wedding feast at Cana in Galilee, the last words recorded in the Bible from Mary's lips, what are they? Do whatever he tells you. It's always pointing back to Jesus. It's always pointing through the Spirit. It's always pointing to the glorification of the Eternal Father. That's the point of the gifts. To raise up God, to magnify God, to showcase God to the world and to the church. And so we indeed pray for the highest gifts. Not having this false modesty and humility, but being on hot pursuit for whatever the Lord has for us for the sake of his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Let's close out in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Ah, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful reminder of the writing of the words of St. Paul. Help us to keep this at the forefront of our minds and hearts. That it's about you, Lord, and it's about your church. Empower us, Lord, with the gifts that you have for us that we may be able to serve out of pure, unadulterated love. It is in your name we pray, amen, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God who lives and reigns forever and ever, amen.